who specializes in intimate uh, portraits of the environment. She was a graphic designer, a photojournalist, and now a fine art photographer. Her work has been part of a dozen of uh, jury's exhibits, several group shows, and solo exhibits. Over the past few years, she has been an artist in residence at Everglades National Park, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, twice at Acadia National Park, and um, fellowship recipient at the Vermont Studio Center. She was recently accepted into, uh, into the Rocky Mountain National Park Residency Program. So Danielle has won awards both in her photojournalism and fine artwork. In 2013, Danielle was a national winner of Canon's Project Imagination Photo Competition with director Ron Howard. Celebrity director Biz Stone, the co-founder of Twitter, chose her winning image to help inspire his short film, Evermore, which premiered uh, October 2013 in uh, New York City. So before we begin uh, the session, I would like to um, ask you guys to put your cell phone on vibrate. And uh, we have some refreshments in the back, so please enjoy yourself. The deadline for the photography contest is uh, May 9th. Okay, and uh, please save the date. The photography reception will be on June 9th. So we will have a reception right here, and we will announce the winners. And then we'll walk over to the Alpha Art Gallery. It's in New Brunswick on Church Street. So I'll be uh, creating the flyer and sending out the email information. All right, so thank you, everyone. And now I'd like to invite Miss Austin. Thank you. <laughs> Um, first, actually, can everybody hear me okay? Or would you rather me use the microphone? Mic. Mic? Mic. We'll use the mic. Okay. All right. So, guys, um, welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. I know it's a beautiful day out, so sometimes it's nicer to be outside than being stuck inside a library. Um, just to let everybody know for this tonight's presentation, there are actually handouts in the back. So pretty much everything we're going to be discussing tonight will be there as a reference to go back to. Um, so um, I'm thrilled to be back. I was here last year and I, for, for their seminar series, and I was giving a talk about the art of seeing, kind of thinking outside of the box. Uh, but this year, we get to do a little something different, talking about the beauty of black and white photography, um, and basically how and why. So tonight's program is going to be majority about a presentation, showing you samples, thinking about and choosing black and white as an option um, instead of color, of course. But then the rest of it, I've got a couple programs. I was going to show uh, basically the transformations of black, uh, the color images to black and white, converting them over. Um, and on the handout, there's also that software, there's basically a list of software options out there to look into. Uh, kind of giving back a little um, kind of background of me. Um, as Kavita had mentioned, um, I'm on my third career. I started off with a Bachelor of Fine Arts. Um, I studied photography, sculpture, painting, drawing pretty much everything, but when I was there in school, one of my professors was starting a graphic design program, and so I was kind of the guinea pig for that program, and he asked me to take a kind of an independent study and said, here's this new software, play with it, let me know. It was Adobe Photoshop. It was the original version that came out in 1991. So, been with Photoshop now for over 25 years. I still love it to death. Um, I'm still learning things all the time as this program is continuously just keeps evolving. So a really great program to work with. Um, I became a graphic designer for about seven or so years. I still do some design work on the side. You'll see a lot of design elements in my work. But one thing I really missed and really enjoyed doing was documentary photography. So I went back to, gra I went to graduate school. I love the idea of telling an, a story with a single image or a series of images. Um, so I kind of went back to school, but what I learned when I went there, I realized is I actually didn't know as much about photography as I actually thought I did. Uh, being a journalist has actually made me a better photographer. It's made me a thinking photographer, uh, thinking about all the elements within a scene, how to approach the scene, looking at everything, looking at the light, looking at the subject matter, and then trying to make the best image possible. I was a journalist for a number of years. I worked for the Daily Record up in Morris County, New Jersey. It's the sister paper to the Home News. Uh, did some freelance work as well. New York Times was one of my clients, including the New Jersey Monthly. Kind of saw the writing on the wall. As you guys know, newspapers have been slowly closing down. Staff photographers are kind of drifting away. And I kind of found what my passion is and what I really enjoy doing was being out in nature. 
Uh, so a lot of today's work you'll see is nature photography. I do have other subjects that I enjoy photographing as well, so you'll see those as um, examples. Um, but it's kind of what gave me my piece. So even though I still have editorial clients and corporate clients, nature is where I like to be. But I'm not your typical nature photographer by any means. Um, a lot of my work is normally, especially today, has been kind of going more towards the abstract. I like photographing these more intimate portraits within nature. Um, it's, I don't, you won't see a lot of grand, big landscapes. Um, and there's several reasons why I don't really work with those grand landscapes. A, we live in New Jersey, and in New Jersey we don't have grand landscapes here. So even though it's a beautiful state, we just don't really have those beautiful grand landscapes. Uh, two, uh, as with many people in photography, you know the reality is the reality is basically that photography is a lot about luck, especially in nature. Mother Nature has a plan, she has an agenda, uh, we go along for the ride, um, but it's a lot about luck being in the right place at the right time, having the right light, and of course then making that image and having your camera to make the image. So, and number three, um, photography is my medium. Is a magnificent tool, but that's all the camera is, is just a tool. It's all about here and here, that's what creates your images. And I, as an artist, I'm always constantly trying to create something maybe that you may not have seen. Or something a little different, something that kind of, you know, seeking my own vision. So, the option, you know, you'll see a lot of works here today, from older works to newer works, and you'll see some of my abstracts, some of the stuff I use today. Is yeah. On? I think so. No? Sorry, guys. Hello. Hey. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I have a loud voice, so it sounds like it's it sounds like it's echoing. Okay. All right. So, oh, my apologies. One other thing I wanted to mention: I consider myself sort of a documentary fine artist, and it keeps going off. Not sure why. Um, I've been in photography for over 25 years. I learned in film, uh, so I learned with black and white, developing film processing it, getting in the dark room, the burning and dodging, and it won't stay on, sorry. <laughs> Not sir. Are you guys still able to hear me still? Okay, we'll keep working with that. All right, guys. So I've been, you know, I, like I said, I've been a professional about 17 years, so I started in the world of black and white, definitely got into color, of course now I shoot digital, but I'm a true believer that what I can create in the camera is what I can present to you. Will I do a little bit of burning and dodging? Absolutely. Will I convert my color images to black, to color? I mean, to black, you know, color to black and white? Absolutely. Um, but I like to still believe that w this tool can create wonderful things without having to use so many of the other crazy filters and other manipulations that are out there. That's a whole other art form. So I kind of stick. I'm very old school in that sense. So getting onto the presentation. So history. Um, reality was photography invented back in 1839, all we had was black and white. There was no option. And color didn't come up until almost 100 years later in, 19, in 1936 with Kodachrome. It makes sense, you know, we see the world in color, it should be seen, represented in color. So you would think that black and white would have just kind of gone go along the wayside. Instead, it's bigger than ever today. Um, it's still a very popular form. A lot of people, a lot of different, uh, basically genres use black and white. It has a beautiful, timeless quality. It has that throwback to the time, you know, to in those far day, far away days. Um, but it's also seen as a fine art. And it's just a great form to work in. Um, and of course, some of our great masters, even though they could choose to go in color, they all chose to stick with black and white. Ansel Adams always a big influence in my work. You know, when he first started, he just he's, he was very disappointed with his images. He didn't think he was getting what he wanted. He goes, I see this magnificent, I, I want to capture it, but I'm not able to get it on film. Um, he was a true believer, if you know his zone system, he was a true believer making a great quality image, but he really, there was so much more to see. He understood then with filters, he could create something, but then the magic was post-processing, basically converting it and then doing the burning and dodging in the dark room. I truly believed he would have loved Photoshop, Adobe Photoshop. Uh, I think he would have loved the digital age. Um, even though he still would have shot four, you know, big format pictures, I think he still would have used digital. Um, Henry Carter Brisson, to me, he was all about the moment. He was waiting for those moments to happen. He would find these sets, these scenes, and just wait for the magic to happen. This is actually one of his more famous images. Edward Weston, um, this man was all about shape and form. He did a lot of nudes, I'm not going to show you any tonight, but he was really about the shape and the form. 
you know, this beautiful image of his, is one of his famous ones too, it's just a pepper, but what does it look like? And that was just amazing of the magic that he could create. Richard Avedon, and a very, very well-known um, portrait photographer, loved photographing interesting characters, was very much into fashion photography, uh, but also was very much into celebrity photography. Pretty much photographed every president during his time, uh, just photographed pretty much anybody. And then Margaret Bork White, one of my absolute favorites as well. She was considered one of the first women photojournalists, and war journalists actually. She also photographed the first cover of Life magazine. But for her, it was wherever the story was, is wherever she was. So, And then Sebastio Salgado. He's actually still living today. He's in his 70s now. But he did all his work in black and white. He believed in the power of the black and white image. And he did a lot of very in-depth stories, um, including this one too, which was of Brazilian oil workers. And just absolutely gorgeous stuff he did. So why choose black and white? It actually can help you make you a better photographer. Because it's all now about composition. It's no longer about color. Color can be of such a power, has such an impact on an image, that sometimes it can overtake the image. But of course, there are definitely times you leave color in no matter what. Um, a fall day, you know, the American flag, there are just times you really just keep that color. But now you really have to take away from the color, you focus on the image, you focus on the subject, you focus on shape and form, patterns and textures, and it basically, of course, the quality of the light. Uh, from an artistic viewpoint, color depicts reality. Black and white interprets reality. It also can take it a whole to a whole other emotional level. Um, because there's no color to direct how you feel, we have a response to different colors. It's not there. So now you have to make your own relationship to the image and about your feelings towards that image. And then how do we see? Well, now we no longer have color, so you have to interpret into shades of grays. Um, of course, light colors will be more like highlights. Darker colors will be short, the shadows. But then think about it, the brightness and the intensity of a color. A dark green and a light green are going to look completely different in shades of gray. And distractions. Many times you might out there be photographing, and sometimes we have very little control what's going on in the background. And you, have, you might be photographing a subject, they're standing there, and then guess what? There's this big, big, bright red car behind you. So all your eyes just going to go right back there. <laughs> so you're going to have this, dis, you know, basically a disconnection between the subject and the background where you don't want it distracting. So the idea is kind of by changing it black and white, it can help basically merge those two, the foreground and the background together. A little terminology. Um, you might hear these terms. Black and white is referred to as monochrome. But monochrome could also be a color. <clears throat> You might have seen images, they're all blue, all red, all yellow, sepia, those beautiful shades of uh, brown that a lot of people use, especially the vintage, kind of a vintage color that people like to use. Grayscale is basically the intensity of those colors and interpreting those colors. So these terms are used as well in black and white. So thinking now that we have basic composition and the importance of composition, kind of now break it down. Uh, contrast is one of the big ones. It basically, you want to be, you know, you're looking for sometimes this wonderful sharp contrast of, color, of basically a black and white or colors. Because now you don't have color, you have to now seek out those contrasts to make a very sharp, very kind of a, an image of interest, you might say. And sunny days work great for this. Or if you're working with a spotlight coming in on a subject or something like this, it makes wonderful, wonderful, basically sharp contrasts. So like I said, sunny days work great. Even though I got two shades of greens going on, they can basically contrast each other. Light, great dark skies, white clouds. Shadows and highlights, it all becomes about structure, about form. That's what you're looking for. Snowy days. New Jersey has this notoriously bad habit of when it snows, the next day it's bright blue skies out and you're like, oh, you're killing me. Um, because you get that bright blue against white and it's so contrasty, it almost hurts the eyes. But converting it into black and white takes it to a different level. It can kind of control that. And now it just becomes about shapes and forms and all these great things kind of going on. Uh, this was a couple years ago when we went that first day of spring where it literally all the snow just stayed on the limbs just for the morning. It's like, okay, I don't care it's sunny. We're going out. So take advantage of it. So this was in Sandy Hook. If you remember, after Superstorm Sandy, Sandy Hook was closed for about six months going under repairs. As soon as it opened, I went down there. This is the beach. Um, I did do some post-processing to really emphasize the contrast because it was a sunny day, 
but I loved this trail that I discovered. It's the trail of a horseshoe crab that unfortunately never made it to the ocean. You can see the shell remains, unfortunately, in the middle. But I love what design he created. I mean, to me, Mother Nature is one of the greatest designers that ever existed. So, same thing, bright daylight, shooting. Long, this is a long exposure of waves crashing over rocks. Uh, long exposure photography. I use long exposures in pretty much, predominantly most of the work I do now. It's a technique, if some of you don't know, uh, basically capturing motion within a single frame. You're using a tripod, some filters, shutter release. You're lengthening, opening your shutter, and just letting that motion see. So you basically, whoops, sometimes my computer does that. <laughs> um, it, la it basically lengthens that exposure out. And basically, you know, you get the smoothness of water, like in waterfalls and streams and oceans. You're going to get this, uh, the movement of grass and trees and the streaking of clouds. So it's a wonderful, wonderful technique um, if you haven't played with it. Um, light. Light, of course, is everything, but I'll be honest with you, the wonderful thing about black and white is it is extremely forgiving. Um, compared to color, you can do a lot more with black and white that you cannot do with color, um, especially in bad lighting. If you're outside, you got that horrible haze light, you can shoot any time of day, which is pretty nice. Even in midday, you can create some very cool graphical things, um, but all it just, it's a really, really wonderful kind of forgiving format to work in. Um, but of course, direct lighting will kind of add some contrast, as I showed you in those previous images. Side lighting will reveal texture, like that early morning light, late afternoon light. And then from any direction, of course, it will create some really nice shadows. So here's an example. This is direct lighting. These are waves crashing on along. This is an Acadia crashing along the rocks. This is kind of one of my long exposure shots. It's sort of in between. I'm kind of freezing the action, but letting it go at the same time. Early morning on the beach, you know, gray pine, just, but it shows all the crazy, amazing texture in the sand. Cleat, opposite time of year. This is actually ice and late afternoon light, but it kind of brings all that cool texture out. Backlighting, great thing. Again, ice storm came through next day, bright blue skies. You're like, you're killing me. Um, but it makes early morning, that wonderful light coming in, it really just kind of brings out the details. And even something as simple as basically a very large palm leaf. It was being backlit, but you get to see this amazing kind of wonderful contrast, some textures, and of course the shadows as well. But to me, it's all about the mood. For me particularly, um, I love cloudy, rainy, foggy, overcast days. Um, give me a sunny day with clouds. I can work with that. If it is a bright blue sky with no clouds, I'd rather go back to bed. It's just, it's, ugh, I'm just, it's just for me, it's like, no, 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 no. Um, for a lot of photographers, this kind of weather is their favorite. So if you're ever going, you say, oh, it's raining out, or, if it's, or maybe it's, just, it's been foggy out all day, go out and shoot. You'd be surprised what you can create. It looks amazing with so many different like landscapes and architecture, how amazing that stuff looks in black and white. I mean, the, probably the only scene I would say looks great in an overcast or foggy day, um, a rainy day, is if you're shooting a river scene or a waterfall, in color, it's magnificent. That's the best time to photograph that kind of scene. Everything is very saturated, it looks beautiful in color, of course, if it's in summer and spring or even fall. Otherwise, go black and white. So, uh, you know, it's a foggy day. This was over at Duke Island Park. After a, basically a big rainstorm in the middle of the winter, the fog stuck, ar stuck around and just can make some nice images. Acadia, Maine. This was at the National Park when I was at. One of the weeks, the first week I was there, it was basically foggy every single morning. Uh, the sun then came out. It was that horrible, hazy sun. Uh, it's kind of the weather I had to deal with, but you can make some interesting images. Uh, there's nothing more iconic than a lobster boat in Maine and with the fog. <laughs> so um, it's kind of nice because right behind it, it was a very small cove. So normally there'd be land mass. There was a land mass right behind it. So this just completely cleared that up for me. Lean background. Um, I actually was at the Rocky Mountain National Park this past summer for my residency. I was there for two weeks in the last two weeks of August. And it was great driving through every afternoon, well, almost every afternoon, storms came running thing. Every morning was blue skies. Every afternoon, storms, thunderstorms, lightning, hail, oh boy. Um, but I was it's driving down the road. It was great. Just pulled over because I saw the rain just coming through. To see that wonderful sheets of rain was really quite magnificent. Um, great Smoky Mountains, just a day that was kind of raining on and off, but these get these really beautiful, quiet, little intimate scenes, and it makes a nice mood. Um, even as something very simple as grass in, the, in a pond can make a nice, lovely image. 
So texture is really great. Um, in black and white, texture is just beautiful. It really just pops so much more, I think, in black and white than it ever does in color. And again, your lighting is going to dictate how much texture you're going to see. Um, so even on flat kind of days, you can still bring out a lot of texture and, um, and a lot of subject matters. So this was Assateague Island. Uh, it was a winter time, but it was great. Got, it was blue skies, good clouds though, which was great. But it just kind of really highlighted these wonderful, wonderful patterns in the sand. Again, blue and sand is like blue and snow. Um, in the Everglades, during the winter time, it's the drought season. It's based on the dry season, so it's, you'll see a lot of this cracked earth. Some really cool textures in it. Water. It's my absolute favorite subject. A lot of the work I do now is with water, abstracts and water. I'm just fascinated by the movement of it. But you can see an amazing texture with water. Uh, frozen water. <laughs> so um, a couple years ago in Sandy Hook, down uh, the Raritan Bay was freezing over. We had such deep freezes. Um, it was just really great to just kind of see all the ice everywhere. But it had high tide in the middle of the night. So all these, basically the waves were kind of crashing over as it was freezing at the same time, kind of froze all over the limbs, made some really interesting stuff. But you can see all the amazing texture just like in the frozen ice. And even wildlife. This poor little guy was just trying to keep warm. It was a very cold morning in the Everglades, but didn't even really see his face or anything. It was all about his feathers and that beautiful, beautiful texture of his feathers. So patterns. I'm always looking for patterns. This is the designer in me, so I'm always kind of seeking them out when I'm out photographing. Uh, you can see sometimes, again, the color can take away from it because you're focusing so much on the color than really on the patterns that's being created. So they're like little lily pads. This was actually, I forget the name of the lake, it's down, down by Six Flags. It was out kayaking. Um, so you got a number of things going on here. Of course, you got directional lighting, so of course it brings out some of the textures in the lily pads. Um, but then, of course, the pattern of them as well. Same idea here. This is uh, down in the Everglades. Um, in the morning, you can see all those little highlights in the fields below it. Those are all spider webs. They're everywhere. Oof, very creepy. Um, but it was great because it was being backlit. You could see all the amazing texture and all these wonderful eye, the droplets of the water and, of course, the base of the pattern of the web. Thankfully, the spider wasn't there. <laughs> Spider's creeping out. Um, I have no idea what this was. This is over at Duke Farms in Hillsboro. It's in my backyard, which I absolutely love. I can just, I'm like a mile away from there, so I can go pop over there anytime. They have the gardens there. But I saw this thing. I had like, again, no idea what it was, but got my macro lens out and just went to town on it. So I just, I love the shapes and the patterns it created. Going back to water again, and this is one of my water abstracts as well. Uh, this was um, in Maine. There was a, a bridge where the water was pulling into the cove, coming out from the bay. The tides are so forceful in um, Acadia, they go basically up and down 13 feet every six hours. So this is one of the tides. This is kind of really forcefully going through. But I basically love, because it was so sunny out, again, it made wonderful contrast with the highlights of the water. Again, the wonderful texture of water as well. And even this, this little waterfall up in Child's Park, you know, up in the um, Delaware Water Camp, it's about this big. So I was able to get, uh, the, I was a rock ledge I could sit on and get my camera down that low. But I just love just the little patterns it created. It kind of becomes abstract. A lot of these can be seen almost as abstracts. <clears throat> or coming on a flight from Denver. You know, if you get that lucky window seat sometimes, um, I normally get the aisle seat, but I got stuck with a window seat. But hey, I got lucky, looked out the window. Rockies were one way, my apologies. Um, the Rockies were one way. This, that was the High Plains, was the other way. And it snowed, of course. I was there during the winter. And this is what you see out the window. It's just absolutely incredible. So just, like again, love what things are, things are out there to look at. So always keep your eyes open. Shapes and forms. Well, everything comes down to shapes and form. We see, you know, the world's three-dimensional, but we, we photograph in two dimensions. So basically everything we have to do, we have to basically show through light and shadows and all the basically things we've talked about to create shape and form to show that world in a three-dimensional, basically in our two-dimensional world to show it as a three-dimensional object. So of course lighting is very important as well. Um, just even something as simple as this, this is a royal palm down in Florida. These are the threads that come off of the palm as it sheds. And just simple side lighting, it can create something very different. If there's color there, then you start focusing so much on the color. This kind of makes you question, what am I looking at? Which is kind of be kind of fun. Trees, trees are absolutely wonderful, wonderful shapes to work with. They just have so much structure to them and they tell their own stories. So they're great things to photograph. 
This is down the mangroves in Florida, and I specifically like to go black and white because I really wanted to emphasize those roots. To me, it was all about this amazing root, root system of the mangroves. This was kind of a fun one. This is in, uh, back up in Acadia. Uh, I was on a pond. Uh, it's actually it's called Bubble Pond. It's a huge pond. And I saw these rocks. I saw the water was completely flat. It was sunny out. You could see the shadows, of course. But the clouds were just whipping by so fast. So I did a longer exposure. It was about 15 seconds because um, I just kind of wanted to mix these two worlds, you know, the, wonder, the wonderful rock shapes with the grass. You could see the layers of the, underneath the water, but then the design. It all comes down to design, really. Everything basically kind of comes to design. Or even something as interesting as ice. You know, in the wintertime, especially when it's um, overcast, water is basically black. So it's just kind of playing with the ice and the form, and I don't know why my computer's doing that, my apologies. Um, but it, it now, again, it becomes about design cool things we can kind of create. So opportunities. Um, in my opinion, you can pretty much choose any genre to convert into black and white. Uh, but the only thing I would kind of choose maybe not to would maybe be sports. Uh, sports is really good in color. I'm sorry, it's team uniforms and everything like that. It just, sports just screams to be, to be, and to be shot in color. But um, pretty much anything else can definitely be converted to black and white. So unless somebody else can think of something else, but that's all I've been able to come up with so far. But landscapes, um, again, if you get these opportunities, you get these grand landscapes, and um, you're going to be seeing all kinds of things. We'll see shapes and forms and textures going on. Good lighting, of course, is important. A good active skies, to me, is always key in a great landscape, especially black and white. Clouds are just beautiful in black and white. Blue skies can sometimes be very, very distracting. I mean, if you're shooting sunrises or sunsets, you got to leave it in color. I mean, <laughs> that's the magic of that. But any other time of day, you know, try transferring them in black and white. You'd be surprised how dynamic it really can become. So, um, my first time to the Rocky Mountains, I was there in the winter time. It would happen to be Thanksgiving weekend, and it just snowed, and it was staying on the trees, and I had the snowshoes on, and. Even though I thought I was going to die because I get altitude sickness and half the time I'm like <gasps> trying to breathe, just get air in my lungs. But uh, to me it was worth it by the time I got up here and was able to make the image because it was sunny out. You could see the shadows, of course, a lot, a lot of contrast with the mountains and the, the evergreens. But, ah, sorry, again, my computer's acting weird. Um, those great clouds. Great clouds have really just kind of made a really nice magical scene. Um, it was just an absolutely beautiful day to be out there. So, again, sometimes that magic happens. Um, this is Raven's Nest in Acadia as well. It's kind of a nice little hidden spot. Again, most of the times when we are traveling and so forth, we only have that one opportunity to be there. We have to kind of make the image that's there that presents itself us, to us at that moment. But if you live near places where they have these kind of scenes, or for me, I was on a residency, so I was there for the month. I began to learn when a good time to go back and photograph something, the right, you know, the right light. This particular scene only to me works in two way, two lighting situations. Sunset, because I'm facing west, that's Cadillac Mountain, or on an overcast day. Otherwise, you would never see all that amazing rock face going down that basically, because that's like a little peninsula and it's a hundred foot drop. So don't go too far out. <laughs> but um, it's really, to me, I kind of learned that. So I found a great overcast day, and I went out there to make the image. Again, a long exposure. So really kind of just soften the clouds in the sky and everything. So, But again, it adds a little bit more dynamic to it. Again, Maine, some great, great cloud activity going on as well. Everglades National Park. Uh, this was great. Bright sunny days, you can see, but look at those clouds. I mean, they're just absolutely magnificent clouds going through. Um, again, I did a longer exposure so you see the softness of the grass. And this is great. This was the old highway that you used to have to go through the Everglades. It closed down in the 1960s, and now it's just an old trail, and there's usually nobody out there, which is absolutely wonderful. Great time to be about there by yourselves. Now, this is also the Everglades, and this is more representative of what the Everglades is. It's basically just fields and fields and fields of just sawgrass. Um, but again, this is a different kind of sky, more stormy clouds, so a very different feeling. Biscayne Bay down in Florida, um, late afternoon, but the clouds were just rolling through. Great thing about Florida, there's usually always clouds around, <laughs> which is kind of nice. Um, and I, I actually liked it because it was kind of mirroring the rock uh, formation as well. So kind of going down and coming up like that, which is what I liked about it. 
And sometimes it is all about the clouds. Uh, this is in the Rocky Mountains. Again, in most afternoons, storms came rolling through. I love this crazy formation that's happening. It's almost like they're looking here going, look here, come look. So uh, same thing in the Rocky Mountains. Um, you can see I'm in the sun where I'm standing. You can see the, basically the contrast of the grass and of course this cool tree thing, this dead tree. But look at that storm that's just going through. So it, weather's awesome in black and white. Like I said, clouds are just absolutely magical. Subjects, people. Um, I did a lot, being a photojournalist, most of the stuff I always did was in color because newspapers and magazines always liked uh, images in color. Um, there are personal projects that I did that a lot of times I did in black and white. Some images I thought were stronger in black and white for my personal use, so I have a few images. But black and white is beautiful on people. It really is. Um, no matter what your skin tone is, it looks great. Um, elderly look wonderful. There's so much texture and there's so much details in all our, our, in our faces and so forth, but it can just be unbelievably flattering too. So um, it's great in the street, street photography. If there's so many crazy things going on, you're taking away that color and then you can just focus on all the activity going on. So this was a World War II vet that I photographed a number of years ago. Unfortunately, he has passed away at this point. Um, but we were doing a story because he was being honored uh, during a Memorial Day service. And he wanted to put his uniform back on. It was the first time he had it on since World War II. So, um, and I'm a believer. I like to do more environmental portraits. I like to put people within their environment, not just kind of really tight shots of their faces, just more my style. But I also love using natural light or any light that's available. I'm really not a big fan of flashes or anything like that. So I try to use what's available to me. Now, most times people would definitely highly recommend not to use really sharp, you know, drastic, you know, sunlight or bright light. To, you know, it provides very harsh shadows on people and is not highly recommended. This was an occasion where I felt it was a little bit more appropriate. This is, um, I worked with another photographer. It was actually a nationwide project uh, with a gr large group of photojournalists on homeless teenagers, on teens actually that had aged out of the foster care system. So now they're 18 to 20, 21. They, you know, they turned 18, well, they're now longer in the foster care, where do they go? And unfortunately, most of them ended up homeless unless they had some kind of means to help them. So we were following three of these young men um, at a local shelter, basically trying to get their GEDs, trying to get a job, trying to get their lives going. And next near where they're at the shelter was this abandoned building. So I thought it had a little symbolic um, reference to it and it was very sunny out but I kind of liked it because it's very harsh it's very strong you see all these crazy wrinkles in his shirt as well but to me it kind of worked for what the purpose of the image was so something very different um, again using just available light and in the living room so I kind of wanted the light to really focus on what's going on here a little bit about the story this is actually my mom or was my mom she has passed away as well but she was a bilateral amputee due to diabetes, and I wanted to kind of focus on her limbs. And their routine in the evening was, later in the evening, my mom would be watching TV, my dad would be in the other in his man cave, and mm. watching the game, and, but he would always come out because her legs would bother her by the time the evening. They'd just be sore having the prosthetics on. So she would take them off, he would come out, check in on her, saying, hey, do you need anything, or anything like that. So it was something I wanted to kind of um, copy, um, basically photograph and capture this moment. It's always important to capture moments where, you know, family, friends, places and things, they're there one moment, they're gone the next. So it's always important that we're taking images. But for this image, it wasn't so much about her face as it was, again, about her limbs. Because diabetes really was taking her piece by piece. It took her legs. She was losing feeling in her fingers. She was blind in one eye. She was losing sight in the other eye. She had a kidney. She had lost her kidney. She had a kidney transplant. So it's a pretty, pretty sad disease. So... That was kind of the purpose of the photograph. So always thinking about that. And then something, you know, silhouetting people. You don't always really have to even see them. You can just, by using the light, the natural light of the window, you can have a gist of what's going on. Flower girls dancing around and having fun. So there's a lot of things and a lot of great, you know, with lighting, you can do so much for black and white with people. And then of course, <laughs> it does work really well on us. Um, I hate being photographed in color. I really do. I look better in black and white. I'm sorry, but I do. <laughs> this is a few years ago and about 30 pounds lighter. But, you know, I just, especially, you know, um, ideally when you're photographing most people, it is better to do in places where um, 
it's a softer light. So overcast days are actually great for photographing people. If it's a bright sunny day, normally then I would say put them under a tree, put them in the shadow of a building. Because guess what? Soft light, it helps get rid of our wrinkles, it helps get rid of our lines, it just no shadows underneath our chins or under our nose. It's just, you know, so I'm outside, but believe it or not, the guy who photographed me had somebody holding one of those big reflectors over my head. So the light was kind of going through like a soft box. So even though it was a lot much brighter out, that's how we got that soft light on me. So otherwise I would say, like I said, get somebody in a shadow, because this is definitely the more flattering light. But again, everybody's in skin tone looks fantastic in black and white. So if you ever get a photo of yourself and you're not great or happy about it, try it in black and white. <laughs> so like I said, I would do my whole world in black and white if I could. Um, so sub, um, structures and architecture. I'm not an architecture photographer, so I don't have any really samples of that. But um, I got some other structures to show you. But think about buildings like uh, the Chrysler Building, the Flatiron Building, the... Um, the uh, Freedom Tower. These are basically the same ideas like mountains and magnificent landscapes. These are beautiful monolith structures. So when they're in black and white, it's all about the shape and the form. It's about the beautiful glass. But if you have that blue bright sky, it can be very distractive from what these beautiful buildings are. So putting it in black and white can just add so much more drama to these things. But old buildings, weathered buildings, if you're traveling throughout Europe, can you imagine things like the Eiffel Tower, all those wonderful castles and things like that? Absolutely gorgeous in black and white. So, and again, abandoned structures as well. Um, I love the abandoned structures. Um, a lot of photographers do. So I think they're absolutely great because they have so much detail, like in the weathered wood and things like this. Um, this is actually the old fort down in Sandy Hook. I always love going down to Sandy Hook. It's a great place. I just always go back there during the off season. Um, but this is the old fort. But you see all this amazing texture and this, you know, the, the stone and everything else. Um, that was after Superstorm Sandy at <laughs> Sandy Hook. It's not there anymore. I don't know how long it took them to dig that thing out. But it's wonderful things you can find. But in black and white, good clouds, doing good. Um, down in the Pine Barrens, there's a village called Basto. It's an old, old village, and a lot of great, a lot of great material to work with down there. Scranton Lace Factory. I uh, had an opportunity to go there with a workshop. Just a great place to photograph. It's been closed down for a few decades now. Architecture is just great. All the brick and stone and all the materials together. Even something like old staircases. This is in the Smoky Mountains. Uh, there was a village called Elkmont. It's pretty much kind of not much is left of it anymore. Uh, this is kind of where the rich go uh, during the last century. This was actually the stairs to a hotel called Wonderland. Unfortunately, there's nothing left of that hotel, but that's where the, everybody used to go. And then something even as like Duke Farms over in Hillsboro. Um, with this image in particular, what I liked about it, a, a great foggy morning, which was nice. And I mentioned about the, the importance of actually taking photos and the importance of documenting things because those trees are now gone. Those were 100-year-old trees, and they've all been basically chopped down, and they put new trees in. So they'll never get that kind of old-world feeling that they had here. Subjects and still lifes. Pretty much anything you photograph, in my opinion, still, again, um, even if you do studio setups, can be great for black and white. Um, flowers. One of my guilty pleasures is photographing flowers, but again, they can be absolutely beautiful in black and white. They're very delicate. Show like giving a little bit of detail. You know, this hibiscus is red with that little yellow in the center, but in black and white, I thought I, I liked it a lot in black and white. Again, just things you find along the way. An old vine cloning, kind of making it going up a structure, made it into a cross. The Scranton Lace Factory, again, this beautiful old piece of lace kind of mixed in with the spools so you get all this amazing detail on the wood and in the lace and then the patterns and the spools. Again, it's just, it's pretty much an endless topic you can work with. And of course, wildlife. Uh, you saw the picture by um, Salgado with the elephants. Um, when I was down in the Everglades, I did a kind of series of portraits of some of the birds and the alligators down there. But normally there's a lot of distraction when, like backgrounds for, you know, especially if they're even in the sky, you got those blue skies, but you get the green brush and so forth, and it can be taking away from the beauty and elegance of whatever the animal you're shooting. Plus, the beautiful thing is most animals are monochrome. They really are. I mean, there's definitely some animals that they're all about the bird, all about the color, like a cardinal that's all red, keep it in color. But most, other, most others can actually really do beautifully in black and white. 
So um, a wonderful regret. Loved him. He just kind of flew right up to me. I'm like, thank you. It was very sweet of you to do that. Uh, doesn't happen often. <laughs> um, he's my favorite. He's a wood stork. Uh, love them. They're really funky looking. It, to me, it's a face only a mother could love. Um, but I absolutely love these. This is a juvenile, so he has a lot of his brown feathers, but I love the detail of his feathers, the texture of the feathers. A snowy egret dancing along the water. That's how they actually get their food, is by all the movement on the water to get fish to come up. Alligators, you know, the great thing, most of the time they're not moving, <laughs> which is nice. The world around him moves, but they have such great texture to them as well. Um, blue herons, great blue herons. They're pretty much a grayish blue, so there's not a lot of color to them. He was getting all tangled up in there. Again, alligators. There was so much in this picture because of the bright, the bright yellowness of the stalks, of the, you know, the grass and everything. So making it into a black and white purely became about the texture and about these crazy patterns. And then almost like, where is she? So like, where, you know, where's Waldo in a way? Um, a cormorant. Beautiful yellow beak, but it was a nice contrast to the, the black of the feathers and the blue of the sky. It worked out. And a blue heron. This is actually open sun, open in the open bay. But now it just purely becomes about shape and form. And of course this guy. He and I had a big old face off. Um, I won. <laughs> he eventually turned around and swam away. But he was a good sized boy there just kind of staring at me. I'm like, dude, just stay there. You're fine. So, but it's amazing when you can have a lot of fun with black and white and animals. So always worth a try. And then of course there's what I call the almost black and white. And there are basically images you're going to show, photo, see that are like, well, it's pretty much black and white. So you know, why should I worry about converting it? It's already pretty much there. And it's like, because there's always a little bit of color. And by pushing it into black and white, you'll see the drama. You'll see that you'll see the change. It just pulls out all that color and it really just forces you to see more of the contrast. Uh, this was in Alaska. Great, I mean, the mountains were amazing. Clouds going through, uh, just the white snow, and of course the black ridges, purely contrast. So there might have been a little bit of blue in the sky, but just go ahead and convert it. Of course, a beautiful snowy day. You know, all that structure and form, but again, there was very little color, but just go ahead and push it over. Of course, snow, I, you know, ice and water. It would reflect some of the colors from the sky, but it's just a little bit more dramatic in black and white. Smoky mountains, after a good rainstorm, they really become smoky. Water against rocks. Water is very much white, when, especially with waterfalls. Rocks, when they're wet, are pretty much almost black. They're almost like a dark brown. So again, taking it over just takes it, just really makes that more dramatic. And then there you get times where I photographed this under a bridge. There was no color. I mean, really, there wasn't for me. I'm like, yay, no work. All right, I'm happy. Uh, makes my life easier. So, so there are circumstances where it can help and it doesn't help. And there's two, there's two topics here. One of it is for bad lighting. Um, you're going to come across situations where there is normally bad lighting. Again, maybe bad daylight or especially indoor light. You go to the store no, now, Home Depot, Lowe's, and you have to buy a light bulb. Well, what do you got? Well, you got cool white, soft white, warm white, daylight. Ugh. Light is temperature. And if you notice, every one of them has a different color. One's a little bit more bluer, one's a little bit more yellower, one's more white. And that is what color, that is what the light is. It's color temperature. So the sun is one temperature. The overcast day is a different temperature. Fluorescent lights are the worst nightmare there ever was. Um, it creates this horrible color. And, but every light is a different texture, basically a different color temperature, and it reflects a different color, especially on human skin. And the worst is if you have a situation where you have multiples. So you have daylight coming in. You've got maybe a lampshade here. You've got a fluorescent light here. And then you've got the flash from the camera. And, oh boy, it just it makes a really bad kind of bowl of soup there. <laughs> so, um, but the second is there are times where you're looking at it going, yeah, it's already black and white, so of course it should be black and white. But believe it or not, there is still color sometimes there, and maybe that little bit of color will make all the difference in the world to make that image really pop, so you keep it in color. It's always worth trying and then seeing if it works or if it doesn't work. So to give you like an example, this was actually photographed down um, and Sandy Hook at that old abandoned fort. But I'm thinking, look, oh, black door, nice kind of light ground, look at all that great texture, we can really pop that out in a black and white. I just wasn't getting it. It just wasn't working for me. I mean, look at that amazing color in the black. All those purples and blues and everything like that. It just was, it just really, really popped in color. So I chose to keep it in color. Um, snow, again, I would say 95%, anytime I'm out shooting snow, 
Again, it's usually on a day like this. It's great. It's already almost black and white. So of course I would just go ahead and convert it all the way to black and white. It creates that wonderful, wonderful mood. But, you know, it just, eh, well, there wasn't one really working for me. So I, you know, because I loved those leaves. You know, the little bit of color of those leaves that were still hanging on, and you see them on the ground, it had some nice, a little bit of color in the water. It just, it, it kind of worked more for me in color. But again, it's all subjective, but it's always worth trying. Now, you ready for this one, guys? Okay. Oh, that's about as bad as it can get. <laughs> um, um, here's the sad part of being a photographer and all your friends knowing that you're a photographer mm. is, hey, can you do anything with this? <laughs> can you save this image? Can you help? Um, so this is, you know, the couple, they're at a wedding. She was one of the bridesmaids, but <coughs> yeah, purple skin is just not very flattering. Uh, this was shot with a camera phone, so that doesn't help either. Uh, but there's really nothing I could do with this. I mean, there might be some experts out there that can really, really work the color, but to try to get you some decent skin tone, but it just is not going to happen. It really isn't. So your best option, you go black and white. So, I mean, it's not fantastic, but, you know, because it wasn't really fantastic the image to work with, but it's a lot better, and it's something that you can now use. I put a nice little funky border around it to clean up the background, but... It's a little bit something I could try to save a little bit, you know. So if you ever have a really bad image, you could definitely try saving it by just converting it to black and white. So there is really bad lighting out there. <laughs> so the last few images I was going to show you guys is some conversions from color to black and white and just how I was seeing it. So this is Oozle Falls in the Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, so I'm hiking up there. It's two and a half miles to get to this destination. It's a thousand miles up. I mean, a thousand feet up. <laughs> and but my guess was, well, I'll, by the time I get there, I'm carrying a 25-pound pack of a camera equipment. It's going to be cloudy and stormy, which this is going to be great. I'm going to have a lot of fun up there because every day it's been rainy and stormy. Guess what? No. <laughs> Mother Nature has her own plan again. It was the one day. It was bright, blue, sunny, cloudless day. And it's like, ah, oh, you're killing me. So by the time I got there, it was about noon in August. So again, very harsh, harsh light. This is, um, this is a longer exposure, of course, at about 30 seconds. You know, I got my tripod, but I'm looking going, okay, what am I going to do with this? Uh, you can also crawl up in the halfway on the left-hand side. You can crawl up. You can kind of see inside the waterfall. So I kind of started here, though. And again, I was doing longer exposure, so I had my tripod out and some filters as well to help reduce all this bright light. So if you see that bottom section, so you see you already have very white, white water, and look how black the stone is. So you're already kind of working in a black and white format if you just kind of zoom in. So little things that you can create, and by this is a one second exposure, but the, you, know, you get a little texture in the water, which is nice and wonderful contrast. So I went moving up along the side of the, um, the waterfall, and so what you see, it's a little video, you don't hear the sound, but you can see how bad the color is. It's not, ooh, you know, very bright, very sharp light, not very pretty, but I did a 30 second exposure, and you can be able to create something very different. So that water that was coming over basically just became mist. The rest is all about black and white contrast, and just about forms and creating something a little in the abstract. The light kept shifting on me, which was great, so this next one, you can see, you see a little bit of the rocks. There's a lot of water coming down, but again, horrible light, not great color. But with the one second exposure, I was able to create something a little different. You know, it's kind of a little magical little kind of vignette, which I really enjoyed. So there's things that you can absolutely do if you just by converting it to black and white. This was another waterfall. Oh, sorry. Huh, we're supposed to see that. <laughs> I'm probably going the wrong way. <laughs> and... You know, so again, bright sunny morning, uh, but that's when the light is on the, on the waterfall. This is Chasm Falls. It's on a one-way road going up. It's only open during the summertime. But by just simply making it black and white, you can really pull out, a, make something very different. Pull out a lot of the detail in the stone. It becomes much more graphical. It becomes something very different. So, so by the time I got to the top of the mountain, clouds had rolled in. It's kind of flat. There's not much you can do with this. It's, you know, I popped in some color and so forth. But even just said, by changing it black and white, the tones really come alive. And it can become something a lot more dynamic. And even something like this, this is Sprague Lake in the um, Rocky Mountains. Cloudy day, it's late in the afternoon. Um, but anytime I find a piece of driftwood, I will do my best to make an image out of it, because I absolutely love driftwood. So I stop, I'm like setting everything up. But again, it's kind of drab. It's an overcast day, not a lot of great color. 
but making it black and white, it can become so much more dynamic. Again, you get these great textures, the, shape, the background is these great shapes and forms. So this is now actually one of my favorite photographs from that trip. Cape May, this was actually shot about 8 o'clock on a uh, summer night, but you see good clouds in the sky as well. It's kind of cool. It is a monochrome. It's already blue. Everything came out in nice blue. It has its own mood, which is kind of nice. But it's kind of fun to see what happens if you make it black and white. You know, and it's purely preference. Might like the color, might like the black and white, but it's very different images. The next day, it's sunny out, though I have a lot of clouds as well, but you got a lot of things going on, a lot of color going on. By making it black and white, you become now to really focus on those piers, which is kind of nice. A bottom of a waterfall, hence almost black and white. I mean, there's very little color in that stone, but by simply doing converting it, it does become more dramatic. So like I said, push it over, just take it over to that next step, that next level. You guys had seen this picture before of an Assateague Island, but I wanted to show it to you in color. Again, bright blue sky. It can be, now, it's still a pretty image, but it takes a different dynamic by putting it in black and white. So, um, last couple slides, and then I'm just going to do a quick demonstration for you guys. So, almost digital cameras, including point shoots, have a monochrome function in your camera, though I would highly recommend never using it, simply because... Um, what you look at in the back of it, you say, oh, there's my black and white image. But it's going to be very flat. It's not going to be what you can truly create using a post-processing program. And if you're shooting in JPEGs, which most people do, JPEGs basically, when, if you put it in monochrome, you lost all your color. Color, you're shooting millions of colors. You put it in a black and white, you're down to 256 shades of gray. So you've lost all that. And you can't convert back to color. So once it's black and white, it's only black and white. If you're shooting raw... Um, and that's a term that maybe most men that like, don't know. It's in that handout. It's a huge description about JPEGs, TIFFs, and RAW images. Every camera has a RAW format. And I'm sure that point-and-shoot cameras are working that way as well. But the RAW format, all that information is going to be there. All the millions of colors are there. Even though it's in shades of gray, you can also convert it back. But I just at this point, I would just say shoot in color. Make it easier on yourself. Then play around with a post-processing program and see what you can create. So... This is kind of a breakdown of a kind of raw and JPEG. Um, I saw this graphic and I loved it. But a raw file means all your information's there. And it's like I said, it's, it's going to take up more room on a disk. But guess what? Disks are the cheapest thing that you can buy. So of course, it just makes sense to buy multiple disks. Um, you can shoot raw and JPEG together so you have a JPEG file as a reference. But the raw information's there that if by chance you overexpose or underexpose, or if you need to try to color correct that horrible pit, purple picture of that couple, you can probably, you can save it. You can save your image. With a JPEG, it's compressed. You've lost a lot of that information. Uh, raw image, you can blow it up much bigger. JPEG, you're going to be limited. Um, it's just, it, you know, not a world to work in. I would always highly recommend, if you're really into photography, focus on really using the raw format. Um, it just works much better for you as well. All right. And software conversion programs. Um, there was a time Photoshop was our only option when converting to black and white, and it was very time consuming. It was not easy. You had to do work a lot with layers and masks and a lot of other crazy things. Lightroom came about. They still, you can still use black and white. It's um, only $9.99 a month, which is actually a great price. These programs used to be very expensive, um, but they're nice to use. I just don't recommend it. There's so many other software programs to, for conversion that are much, they're, they're, they're basically designed to help you do fast conversions. And if you're like me, I hate doing a lot of post-processing. So I'd rather have something that I can do fairly quickly. Uh, Google purchases NIC software and it's free. They have a number of programs that's part of the NIC program, the NIC software, download it. Anything that's free, download. It's a blessing to have. Um, I use On One software. Um, it is a little bit more expensive, but it has a number of programs within it. Um, not just black and white, it has a whole bunch of effects that you can use if you're into HDR or the grunge look or you're just looking for some fun filters, movie effects, and so forth. Um, it has a program specifically for portraits if you're into using portraits. But if you're also, uh, a great program is also within the program is the enlargement. And <coughs> Photoshop and Lightroom, they can enlarge your photos, but on one can do it 10 times better. It's just the quality is much better if you're enlarging your programs. A lot of people love Topaz. I know a lot of people like it. I haven't been using it. Uh, MacFoon is a fairly new one. It's only for Apple only. 
So, but again, those pro you know they have other um, programs within those uh, those as well. The nice thing is these are all trial. You can try them out, see them if you like them. They can run individually, or they can run as, as plugins for Photoshop or Lightroom or Photo Elements. So they work both ways. All right. So I was going to show you two programs. I was going to do one transfer um, for. Nick Silver Effects, and then show you on one software, just to give you guys a feeling of what these programs can do for you and how simple it really can be. So we're going to get out of that. All right, so this is um, a color image. I photographed, this is at Round Valley Reservoir this past winter um, in that snowstorm that we had. And you can see some great clouds and everything. When I brought it in, I kind of pulled up the shadows a little bit, brought the highlights down a little bit. So it's kind of, but this is how it looks. It's pretty flat. And you could definitely go and use color filters to kind of bring some saturation back in and bring it to life. So using Silver Effects, I wanted to show it to you in color because when you open up Silver Effects, it comes in as black and white. So now you're kind of, now you're working in a plane. But you can see how flat this is. Um, Photoshop like has a nice little black and white conversion. This is what it would look like. It's very, very flat. And you're like, oh, there's so much more you can do with this. So the nice thing, like I said, it's a free program. So you see all these wonderful little thumbnails, and it kind of shows you what you can do. Um, they have an all function. They break it down in different categories. But so basically what I always have to recommend people do is just kind of scroll through them and see what you like and what you don't like. Like, ah, no, that's not good. Um, yeah, man, you know, I lose all my clouds. Um, this is way too dark. Not good. Not good. They're really not good. Uh, you know, um, this is not bad. This is not bad at all. Way, way too dark. Um, so you just, you're basically kind of going through, and I found there's one here I kind of liked. Uh, this is one of them, and then I kind of chose that one. A lot more drama, light the skies, it's very dark here, and so forth. So your interface is on your right-hand side. You see your brightness, your contrast, your structure, shadows and highlights, um, and then we go down all the way through. So I tend to want to pull up my shadows because if you've never heard the term histogram, it's on the last page of your, uh, the flyer. But basically, it's basically looking at your whites and your blacks. Well, that's jet black. That's 100% black. That's not always a good thing. And then this would be white. But there's no whites, which is nice. But if, you, if I scroll along, you see we're all, those are my different shades of gray in between. So the idea is to try to kind of prevent as much black blacks, to have a little bit of detail in your blacks, and if you can have some detail in your whites. So you can always use that as a reference. So I might go up here and pull up my shadows a little bit. So we're like, okay, that's kind of cool, you know, but do I want to maybe add a little contrast? You can maybe play there. I always suggest sometimes taking your little, your bars and just going all the way. Wow! You know, it kind of gets you an idea of the extreme. Because if you see the extreme, you can see where you want to go with it. So, now down here are some interesting features. You'll see this thing called neutral. Um, if you guys ever remember the day of film, Triax, T Max, Ilford, oh my gosh. They like to give you these options and maybe playing around with them. Um, I actually avoid them. To me, they're just, ugh, I don't see the, you know. <laughs> it's different ways of looking at the black and whites because their films all had different effects when shooting film. People would choose a film specifically to see what it, the results will be. And you can see some will be really grainy. I don't know if you remember those old photographs, all that dark grain, but it could have it's a really nice effect, which can be cool. So, you know, I just leave it in neutral. That's just me. I don't, you know, I don't go too crazy because again, they, sometimes they give you so many options. You're like, whoa, wait, stop. So, um, but again, you can play with your grain, how much grain that has. I just leave it in neutral. Um, so, color filters in the days of film, whenever you were shooting, like if you were shooting landscape, you would use a red filter to give you those dark black skies. So, this option here basically gives you those options if you want to, if you had basically had put in a filter on top of your lens. But again, you know, so it's like an overall filter effect. But, you know, again, if you're really into it, that can be a really nice option. Again, it's not one I use. I go down here where you see the color sensitivity. Now it's affecting those specific colors. Anything that had any red in it, anything that had any yellow, green, cyan, and blue, and so forth. So the idea is, you can see, if you play the scroll, you just kind of go back and forth. See how the foreground is adjusting? So maybe I want to make it a little bit darker. You can see with the yellows. Again, it's more in the foreground. I might play a little darker. So there's not a lot of greens, of course. Like I said, you, do you see anything changing? No. So there are really no greens in this image. But there were definitely blues. 
So I can really pull that sky down, I can really pull that water down and make it really dramatic if I want. So it's just kind of playing around and just seeing what you like, the effect that you like. Um, <laughs> Tonal levels and curves. Again, this is black, this is white. You can sit there and you can play a little bit. You know, you can bring it down. You basically just add, you know, it's moving it around. An S curve is always nice to work with, but it's kind of either do I bring up my highlights, do I bring down my shadows and bring down my blacks and so forth. And it's really just a lot about play. So coming down here, you get some finishing techniques as well. Um, they have some nice, oops, sorry. Ah, there we go. Um, finishing tones. Toning. Again, those days of sepia. Yellow. So it's all one color. Woo! You can have some fun with that one. Um, and again, just purely something you might enjoy and you might like. Um, all right. So vignetting. That's the effect that goes around the images. You've probably seen these. They come in white and black. And then, of course, you can actually change the effect of it, how much, how big the circle will be, the size it's going to be, and so forth. Um, sometimes I use vignetting if I want to really tone down the edges, but again, I don't play with it too much. Same thing with burning edges. It allows you to play with the different edges, techniques, and so forth, or one edge at a time if you just want to do the top, left, or bottom. So all those different things. And of course, if you like borders, whee! So it, gives, it does a lot of nice things for you. So this is kind of fun. So the one little thing that's really nice in here is called selective adjustments. This thing called control panels. You click somewhere on your screen, Ta da A little menu comes up, and now it's all sliders. This is your brightness, your contrast, your structure. Structure, by the way, is like details. It's pulling out the texture. It's really going to pull out those details. But you always want to be careful. Like here, if we overdid it on the overall image, yikes, right? So, but if you go the other way, ooh, that's kind of misty and magical there. So you kind of sometimes play around with that. But here, you'll see this little tool basically emphasizes what air, how much area you want to work with. And then say, you know, I want to bring up my structure a little bit. Bring a little detail. See that happening? So I know it's a little harder on the screen. I see it more on mine. But they can absolutely bring out some of the detail, which is nice in that one little area. You can actually brighten it a little bit if you wish, you know, so you can play around with it. Um, and then you could just back to another control point. You might go over here and do the same thing, really pull out some structure, which is kind of nice. Um, maybe down here, maybe on the rock, if I wanted to add more detail but I'm gonna bring down the circle because I want to emphasize here and so forth. So you can really bring out some detail and make that thing brighten up. So, and then I just kind of click on if I want them to disappear. So here, there was my image. That's my image now. So very, a wonderful free little program. I need a lot of things that you can do. So it has a lot of nice stuff you can work with. So, all righty. And, all right. I'm going faster than I thought it was. Oh, we're awesome. We're doing good. Okay. <laughs> so the last one I want to show you is on one software. Uh, here we go. Now this one I opened up individually. This one on one software is a plug-in with my Photoshop program. And I'm going to bring you to this one. So here's something bright sunny day. You know, it's not bad. It's, not, it's kind of funny color and so forth. But you might want to bring it, see what you can do in black and white. So I basically, it's a, it's a plug-in. They just came out with a newer version of the On One software this past week. So I just downloaded it. So it's got some new features, which is kind of nice. And it's just going to open it up. Takes a second. My apologies. There you go. So what you're getting on the left, again, are your thumbnails. So here, they've got two different things going on. They have filters. All these great filters. Black and white, antique, beach, you know, everything you can think of and all the different things you can think of. And within each one of these, of course, is more options. It can be a little overwhelming, but it can definitely be a lot of fun if you want to have, you know, just go and have play and so forth. But there's photo filters, lens blur, HDR, a grunge look if you're looking for something kind of funky, that kind of thing. So the presets are basically combinations of these filters. They designed a number of presets of saying we're going to take more than two filters, maybe two, three, four, depending how many, and they're going to combine them together to give you something, a platform to work on. And they can be really nice. So like a black and white one here. So it has all these number ones to play with. And again, this little feature here, you can see more options. You see them bigger, which is great. Um, and it's really, again, going through and trying to find one that works for you. 
So this was one I kind of liked. It was a dramatic sky. Over here is your interface. So what it is, is a combination of two filters. You see the tonal enhancer down there, and you see the black and white. So if I turn the black and white off, it got more intense. So this was what it was originally. This is what it was adding that tonal. It basically added a lot of color and contrast. So then adding the black and white takes all that and now makes it black and white. So again, you'll see very similar features as you did with the Silver Effects program, is that you have all these things, the color chart here. Again, you get to play with the colors. Um, these up here again are those ones where if you wanted, if you were thinking of putting a color, um, a filter on top of it, so it's not gonna change the color, but it's basically, that's what it was if you used a green filter, which is kind of nice. Um, if you added a red filter, that's what it would be. But again, I just play with the individual colors. I like to play. So, I'll show you a little hat. I think, is this the half and half? Oh, no, sorry. There we go. So you see like the reds. Well, look how bright they are here. Normally, I like, I like my reds much darker. Can you see those things getting darker? Mm -hmm. All right, again, maybe bring out, bring and darken down the yellows. Uh, maybe want to really darken up that blue sky. So these are things that you get to play with. And of course, down here, the tone. This is my brightness. My shadows, I'm pretty dark in my shadows. Here, now this actually has a histogram. That's your blacks. That over here to your other side is your whites. You see that top corner. Again, I don't have a lot of whites, which is great. Um, so that means I have my detail. Um, I'm kind of on the border of blacks, but that's okay. But you know, maybe I want to pull up the shadows a little bit. You know, again, you can see what it does. If you go too far, I might want to ensure my highlights stay down. Um, you could actually pull out detail. Woo, you know, play around with how far you can go um, and so forth. But I'm going to do something different than adding detail through that. Toner, just like Silver Effects, you have all those options that you might want to play. But what's nice about this one is you can make your highlights one color and you can make your shadows another color. And you could change <coughs> the hue, you could basically change it the hue, whatever you want to do. So if you really like that, that wonderful color effect, but you want something, you know, add a couple different colors together, you can have a lot of fun. Um, there's your film grain option again. You can choose your different film options um, if you're into that and add how much grain you want to add to it. So I'm leaving my tonal enhancer alone, so I'm going to hide that. I'm playing with my black and white. So the nice thing is with this program is you get to add layers. So I'm going to add a layer. So all those filters I showed you earlier, I can choose something. So there's one here called dynamic contrast. See all that detail just popped right out. So I just added a, just added a filter to it by simply adding that, brought all that amazing detail in the boat and everything out. So sometimes you say, maybe that's just too much. There is an opacity level. You could say, ooh, okay, maybe I, don't want, maybe I just want it 50%, depending on how much information I want to put on. So again, you guys can add as many filters as you want. You can add a vignette if you like. Um, you can say, I want a, maybe a subtle. Maybe that might be nice. Okay, and play with that. So you do that. So what's new about this program now is what they call local adjustments. Oh, one other little feature over here. There's also this menu over here. It's about masking and a brush, which is nice. You see there's a little eraser tool. It's supposed to help erase bigger objects. There's also the retouching brush. You see this nice, lovely little piece of dust I've got there? You just kind of go over it. You can do this in Photoshop as well. It's gone. So you can help work on things and so forth. One other tip sometimes too, I would highly recommend sometimes blowing it up 100%. There's my scale. I'm actually at 400% there. But 100% is great because you always want to blow up your image to 100% whenever you're doing any retouching whatsoever so you can see what you are doing. Because it says, oh, it looked great when it was on the normal screen size, but you get a little bit too, you blow it up and you start seeing some crazy things that you're like, that wasn't supposed to happen. So always blow your image to 100%. So going back to the normal size, so local adjustments. This little paintbrush over here, you can paint things in. There's your size of your brush. Feathering is whether you want a solid edge on your brush or a nice soft edge on the brush. These are all techniques in Photoshop. The opacity, do you want 100%, 50%, and so forth. But what you get to do, you see these options, light, darken, detail, vibrance is if you had color, and all these other little options. You are now going to paint things in. So maybe I want to paint some detail in. You can start noticing on here, you see how the, some of the details really pulling out in the wood? And then maybe here, 
And basically what it is doing is it's making the whiters whiter and the darkers darker. So it's really all about contrast. That's actually what sharpening is, is really making the contrast more defined. And that's actually what sharpening is. So basically I'm just kind of sharpening these things. I'm trying to pull out some more detail. And if you go down here, oops, sorry, this one, that's what I painted in. You see a little overlapping because my opacity was at 43%. So if I overlapped a part of the area, it's adding another 43% on top of it. And again, another adjustment layer. You could do the opacity. You say how much you want, how little. You can also paint things out. There's a paint in function. You can paint things out as well. So if you wanted something softer, take away detail. You can make something much softer. So there's options. You can do the complete opposite. Um, you could do another filter. You say, you know something? I want to darken up something. You saw the exposure level came down here. Where the detail it went up here, so that's what's affecting. It's affecting one of these ranges here. And I say, you know something? I want to darken this grass. Whoops. Did I do that? Yes. Oh, I was doing paint out. I need to do paint in. Sorry. <laughs> so now you see the grass gets darker, and you can really just paint it in. Maybe I'll, get this, maybe I'll make the buoy a little bit darker. I'm doing a kind of sloppy job here, but it gives you an idea. It's basically just kind of painting it in, making it darker, and making it darker. You can see this little window here, too. That's your mass layer. You can revert that if you don't like it. You can trash it if you don't like it. Um, you can invert it. Changes the opposite. The rest of the image became darker instead of, instead of the, uh, the grass. So there's definitely options here that you can play with. Um, once you've got that section... You know, sorry, whoop, that section created. There's where I was coloring in. You can do more things. I can make it even darker. Whoop. Um, I could add more detail to it if I wanted to, or take away detail, make it softer. Once you're in that, that area that you colored, that basically you painted in, you're affecting that and so forth. So you can definitely change and play around with it. So, and you can just keep adding more and more filters. For each thing piece that you're affecting, you can go back and add another layer. So one other cute little thing you can do You've got all these things going, all these layers going on, but I'm going to go back to the black and white layer. I don't want to touch the vignette or the dynamic contrast, but there's this other little brush here called a mask, masking brush. So just maybe you might want to bring the color back in your black and white images. You've probably seen images like that where the whole image is black and white. Maybe you saw that there's just got a yellow rose or something like that, and you can basically paint your image in. You do a much better job than I'm doing. Um, if you use, I think, the command key, I think it is, it only picks up the tones that you selected. So it's only picking up the reds, anything in that red hue. So it's nice it's not picking up the blue boat, uh, which is nice. And you're just kind of playing around with it. Say, so, okay. So this is what you can do, which is kind of nice. All these wonderful little things, you can do burn, like I said, it's burning and dodging but doing it just within this program. You don't even need Photoshop. Get rid of this part of it if you don't like it. You know, there it is. That's what I, that was my mask layer. I say, eh, I'm going to actually reset. I don't want it. But now you get a preview of this was in color. This is your black and white. So that gives you an idea. So, and then the nice thing about this program, you can either save it as a layer in through Photoshop you can export it. There's a function here if you want to export it. You can make it a JPEG, a TIFF. You can give it any size you want. You can tell it exactly what you want it to do if you want to export it. Or you just simply save it. I say done. And what it's going to do, it's going to take me right back to Photoshop. And it's going to add a layer, a new layer to my old original color photo. So it's a separate, almost like a separate image. And we'll see that in a minute because now it's rendering it. So it gives you a lot of wonderful features. That's why the program it does cost money. Um, They're always making constant improvements, but it's definitely gotten better and better. It's a fun program to work with. And again, you can make a lot of things alive. So here's my layers. So, you know, I have now both to work with if I want to. All right, so that's it, guys. Just to give you a little taste of what's available out there. Like I said, some wonderful things. Again, there's so much wonderful things in black and white, especially if you're working with the photo competition coming up this week, next week. Um, you might look at some of your images and say, you know, it might be better in black and white. <laughs> so, um, but if you have any questions, more than please ask. I'm, I'm going to be here for a few minutes. I'm not running away. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate you having me. Thank you. Oh, yes. I'm over here. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> I've already seen the dark. This, is, um, this cost, does it cost a lot or is it not that? This one, it's in the worksheet there. Yeah, this one's about 120 bucks.
like yeah, I mean, it is a really, really wonderful program. Um, when they do upgrades, there's always what they call like their halfway up, like a partial, like a. Yeah, this was uh, there was the one before it was a ten was a ten version. Then the ten point five was free. Then this one came out. So whenever they have a big conversion, you have there's another price tag to pay, but it's not the full price because you've already been paying for it, and they you know they realize that. So they want you to keep buying the product, but they they're going to give you. So I had to pay seventy bucks for it, but I hadn't bought I hadn't bought in a version about four years. So, because um, a lot of times what they have it works just fine for me. But if they suddenly, because a lot of times, just like with Photoshop, and the problem with Photoshop was every time they came out with a new edition, you had to spend 800 bucks for the program. You're like, are you kidding me? Yeah. So the nice thing is with the 10, the 9.99 a month is every time they make a version, you're already getting, you're just getting the nice updated version. You're not paying any more. And so they realize that. Um, so unless you've made a lot of changes. I'm not going to pay for it, <laughs> you know. And this version had a lot of a, a lot of changes. They added also they have something called RAW, working with the RAW files. So I want to play around with that because that's something new for them. So again, they're offering a lot with their new this latest version. So I was willing to pay the money for it. So and it's a tax write off. So <laughs> yes. And this works integrated with Photoshop. Yes, absolutely. Because this was this one I have. Like I said, this one is a is a plug in layer. I have it in two different areas. Um, I have it here. Oh, where did I go? Ah, there it is. So um, there's that one right there. It's called the Effects 2017. My old Effects was number 10, and it's also here. That's a plugin, and you just plop it right into your plugin menu in Photoshop, or if you use Lightroom, or if you use Photo Elements, it works with any of those programs. So, or it works individually. That's what's nice so about it's a this. Also. It's a standalone. Every one of these software programs is a standalone program, or it can be integrated with any with Photoshop or Lightroom or Elements. They design them that way. So, so. As, as, as somebody who's just getting into this, yeah. um, would, would you recommend with like the Photoshop subscription? Absolutely. Uh, no, for, I mean, it's a great price. Again, if you can pay it, I would absolutely. Photoshop is an absolutely amazing and powerful program. Um, it's worth looking at tutorials. There's a lot of online free tutorials. There's a lot of companies that have courses that you can pay for. It's a very small subscription. Um, I think it's Lydia's, um, Lin, is it Lydia? Yeah, dot com. But there's a whole bunch of things out there. Plus, the wonderful thing is, anytime I have a question, I Google it. And guess what? You're going to find an answer. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Everybody's willing to share information out there on how to do something. But Photoshop is an absolutely wonderful, wonderful program. It can be very overwhelming, but if you're a little bit patient with it, learn a little bit. It's also, if you're good with software, if you're comfortable with software, it can be actually fairly easy to use because most programs kind of work in the same format. Right. So, but I would definitely highly recommend it. But I mean, if that's something you don't, you're not like, eh, I don't need it. Because as you can see, I can pretty much do everything just right here with this program. I can do my burning and dodging. I'm still a little old school. I would do a lot of things here, but then I actually bring, I bring it into my Photoshop program, and then I play with masks and layers in Photoshop. That's just because how I learned, because I was, I've been using Photoshop for so long. So. And, and the Photoshop that you use yeah. is the same one that artists use for animation? Like oh, um, you know, I don't know if they use it for, yeah, I guess so they could use it for animation. Yeah. I've never got into animation, but absolutely, it, it, this is the professional level. There's only one Photoshop out there, and that's it. Because it's, my daughter's a, an artist. Oh, and okay, if yes. I, if I can get two birds with one subscription. Oh, absolutely. No, this, this is a great program. Um, you know, this you could do a lot of drawing. It has a 3D effects in here as well. So I think you could do a lot of fun things. If you're used to drawing, if she's used to drawing on the computer, absolutely. Um, there is another package with like Adobe Illustrator, which is a drawing program, but then that is more, it's like 29 a month. Um, I still have the oldest, like this very old version, but because I just, I'm usually creating like logos and things like that. I don't need something like that. But um, I also use InDesign. That's part of that package. But again, my older version works just fine for doing lay, page layouts and so forth. Because all these programs work together. They're all Adobe, so which is great. But Photoshop's a wonderful program. I think she would love it. I honestly, I think in, in kids today too, they just adapt so quickly to software. <laughs> For us, it's like, what? <laughs> you know? I mean, I didn't even learn to type until after I graduated from college. So, and, you know, I, the software programs I started with, like I said, I was privileged to be working with this since college, but what we had beforehand was, yeah, kind of a joke compared to what's available today. So, it's a wonderful, wonderful program to use. Great, thank you. So, you bet. All right. Well, thank you guys. Again, appreciate you coming. Really do. All right.